Hackers and we are here. Oh, sorry, I forgot it wasn't recording. Yeah, so we are, uh, we are NUS Hackers and we are organizing this project intern uh, kind of internship sharing session along with a mentorship session that will be open later on. Um, so I think something you can expect from this session is trying to give you guys a bit of a rundown about um, internships, the process of internships, and also we have a quite an exciting pet panel of panel of people who will be talking about their experiences and answering some of your questions um, after um, after the uh, after the sharing session. Okay, cool. Yep. So, uh, for those who are interested in joining, like the Telegram channels that we have, or even accessing the slides that we have, um, we have the links up on the uh, slide right now. And if you are want to submit questions, there is also like a bar at the top of every slide with the link to submit the questions uh, as well. So yeah, uh, I think, can we go with next slide? Yeah, oh, okay, I, I think the slides got flipped. But yeah, so I think a quick introduction of ourselves uh, would be good. So hi, my name is Tia Hao. I'm a year three computer science undergraduate in NUS. So I've previously interned at companies like DBS, DSO National Laboratories, and Betafy. So I've done quite a bit of uh, different types of internships in software engineering and research um, in different fields like finance. Um, this cycle, I managed to get offers from Google, Citadel, and Palantir, and I'm currently interning at uh, Citadel. And with me, my co-host today is Ben, who is also from part of NUS Hackers. He's a year one computer science undergraduate, um, and he has also been interning at various places like Shopee, QCP, Capital. Uh, and he has had received offers from Binance, Shopback, and GovTech. So, um, yeah, so hopefully that uh, that's pretty much all of the introductions. Um, besides that, we can move on and, and look at the main content of today. So uh, can we go to the next slide? Yeah, so as I've said, we've kind of broken down this today's session into three main components. We have the presentation, which is about 40 minutes. Um, there's a bit of a five minute break. And then after that, for the rest of the time, uh, we will be having a panel discussion where we try to bring on board panelists from different backgrounds to share their insights and their experiences. Cool. Next. Uh, yeah. So today's main philosophy um, and the primary reason why we are here today is to really try to share with you the high level uh, idea of how to prepare for internships. Um, so things like um, how exactly you can be applying, how exactly you're going to write your resumes. We won't be focusing on that, um, but we'll try to go through key concepts about the process and hopefully um, you can come back to the slides at any time to refer to the resources that we have available. Cool, next. All right, yeah, so as I said, the link for, this, uh, for the Q&A is above every slide, so feel free to go um, send any questions you have for the panelists um, and we can move on from there. So next, please. Cool. Yeah. So I think the the biggest question, and I guess uh, a good reason for why many of you are here, uh, you is that you may be wondering why exactly do we need to do an internship, right? Um, it may seem like it's a quite a red race thing where like a lot of people around you, your friends, uh, and everyone in your course is like all hunting and gunning for good internships. But why exactly are we looking um for an internship? Uh, next, please. Yeah. So I think there are six kind of big reasons why we uh, why people tend to do internships. I think the first three, colored in blue, tend to be less, um, less tangible in the sense that the benefits that you get from these aren't as, um, aren't as material and immediate. So it's things like meeting new people, exploring the world, um, of course, earning money and, and having like working with like various really smart people is definitely a very big perk. But I think the last three points are the points that are the most tangible and the most applicable, I suppose, to many of you here, right? So the first, sorry, uh, next piece, is the graduation requirements, right? So I think in NUS, and I believe in many other universities, they tend to have a uh, graduation requirement where you are required to do one internship, two internships um, over a summer break, over a semester before you can graduate. So I think that's the biggest um, kind of driving after if you even if you and do a thousand decodes or, or whatever, um, most people have to do the internship anyway. So I think that's the biggest uh, reason uh, people will have, right? Um, the next reason, uh, next please, is the ability to kind of translate your real world experiences 
from school, uh, sorry, the ability to translate the lessons you've learned in classes, um, in like software engineering classes, even in like data structures and algorithms and putting them into practice, right? Being able to kind of work in teams um, in this much larger firms or even smaller firms um, and kind of seeing your impact be made to the consumers, being uh, seeing your impact uh, be made to create certain products. I think that's uh, a very big key point in internship hunting and, and allowing you to uh, uh, contribute back to these companies and, and create good products, right? And I think the last point um, really is about the... Uh, next, please. The last point is really about finding out what you like, right? So there are many different factors that come into an internship. There are many different kinds of industries that you can look for. There are many different types of companies, right? Um, there's companies that are smaller, like startups or much bigger companies like big tech. Um, you may also be interested in looking for different kinds of purposes, right? Some companies may be focused very solely on the software and the product. So companies like, say, Google, um, who tend to want to build specific products. Um, and the whole business is basically software products, right? You have consultancies and you also have quant, um, quant companies, right? Or, or uh, hedge funds. So there are many different kinds of these companies and you can perform all sorts of roles, right? You can do front-end, back-end, um, product management, data engineering, site reliability engineering. And I think doing internships is a fantastic medium for you to actually learn about these industries and learn about the fields without having to, um, without having to, to kind of commit yourself to a full-time role, right? You, you can use these opportunities as a way to um, get started with your, um, with understanding this, the potential careers in the future. Yep. So uh, next, please. Yeah. So I've, I've said quite a bit. Um, I've said quite a bit about why you want to do an internship. I think now the burning question that many of you would have is then what's the, the process um, for the internship hunting? I think it's um, not, a, not a particularly mystical idea or a process, but I think it is good to list out the specific components for it so that um, you guys have a much better picture of the process. Okay, cool. Next. Yeah. So right now we are all here in May of 2023, or I guess 2024, sorry about the slides, um, where we are watching this talk, right? Um, afterwards, or uh, even now, we are already in the summer. Um, so the summer is where you begin to kind of prepare yourself for for the uh, interview process it tends to be when internships open. So I think we can now kind of focus our attention on the three main components that you can start doing in the summer. Um, the first being preparing for your resume. Uh, next, please. Yeah, next, yeah. Yeah, so generally resume writing isn't a very straightforward thing in the sense that there is a lot of um, attention to detail that you need. There's often a lot of things that you, um, that you have to pay attention to in terms of the wordings of your, uh, of your content, in terms of the structuring of your resume, in terms of the kind of content to be even include, right? Um, we won't cover the specific details of every single component, but we highly recommend these three resources um, to figure out how to ex actually start creating your resume. Um, and if you're looking for any kind of templates that you want to use um, to get started, we do also have some links to resume templates. Some of these are written in uh, LaTeX or LaTeX, uh, and you can basically kind of edit different parts of it to suit your needs and to, and to include the information that you want. Cool. Uh, next, please. Uh, but I think we won't, as, as I said, we won't cover the key details of all of these different components, but I think um, some of the core guidelines remain the same across many of the roles and even, um, even 10 years down the road, it's likely to remain very similar, right? I think the most important guideline is traditionally most students um, and most people tend to keep their resumes to within about one page. Um, so try to make your resume as concise as possible, keeping it within uh, one page, one site. The next kind of key point is trying to include things that you think um, are meaningful. It doesn't have to be something that is particularly amazing. Uh, even if you made like a, ch a very simple chat uh, app, I think everyone starts somewhere. So I think it's very important that you create things that you're interested in and then after that, include them in your resume so that you at least have some talking points basically um, in your resume. Cool, yeah. And I think another, uh, another thing to highlight really is try to showcase your strengths through your contributions rather than saying, I built, uh, built this and this platform with this and this technology. Um, we do highly recommend trying to um, showcase your strengths through it. Like for example, 
built this platform which increased the amount of user traffic by by 40-50%, right? It's It gives you a much big, bigger talking point and it shows the, your ability to kind of create results from the things that you have done and your contributions. Okay, cool. Next. Yeah, and I think another part of the process, right? As I've said, resume writing is uh, quite an intricate process. You do need uh, quite a bit of refinement to it. Um, it's re receiving feedback for the resumes that you have created, right? So there are different platforms that you can try using. Um, there's things like the resume review portal created by the Tech Interview Handbook, uh, the creator of the Tech Interview Handbook, where you can kind of upload your resume and get people to share their feedback on you. So it's kind of crowdsourcing the feedback that you're getting. Um, you can also try to get your friends to look look, uh, look over it, right? Uh, many of them are also uh, in this kind of internship hunt with you. So it's definitely good to have more pairs of eyes from people in your relevant fields, uh, in your relevant courses. Um, the last one is, of course, you can try leveraging um, Project Intern, the chat itself, right? You can try dropping a very courteous message, um, indicating like your purpose, which is like updating a resume and perhaps the roles that you're interested in applying in. Uh, and then after that, uh, requesting for people to kind of give you the feedback. I think that tends to be quite a bit of um, more con more prominent users, quote unquote, or people who are more consistently on the chat who are more than willing to do the uh, resume reviews as well. Cool. Next, please. Yeah. So I think another concern that I think many of you might have is that what if I have nothing to put? Right? I think that's completely normal if you're a year one or even... If you're year two or year three, not everyone has um, has like 20 different projects you can pick and choose and include in your resume. I think that's not feasible, right? So how exactly can we go from having nothing to having at least something to include in our resume? Um, and that's kind of where this uh, this section I'm um, trying to focus on. Uh, next, please. Yeah, so yeah. So basically we'll be talking mainly about building your skills and experience. Uh, next, please. Yeah, so I think that's kind of where the adage of hacker culture really comes in, which is really trying to build something that you think is cool, build something that you think solves a problem that you're facing, right? There are different kinds of projects that you can try to embark on, things like solving a problem that you and your friends face, or even following online tutorials, right? Where they teach you how to build, say, for example, your own Golang interpreter or your very own BitTorrent client. So those are things that you can try exploring. Um, there are, of course, other mediums like contributing to open source and also even following... Uh, YouTube tutorials. I think these are all possible mediums and projects you can do. Um, the last one, technical writing, I think it's a slightly more niche. It's a, a slightly rarer thing to have uh, to, that most people embark on. But I think if you're someone who is interested in um, in talking about the work you've created, talking about, uh, writing about the details of the project or whatever you have learned, I think technical writing is a nice medium. Uh, and funnily enough, I actually got my previous internship uh, through the technical writing. So I think it allows you to um, demonstrate uh, the technical, your ability to understand and kind of condense and concise technical information, which I think is something that many of the companies also look out for um, when you're applying to them. So I think uh, while it's rather niche, technical writing and many of these other projects definitely are ways you can try building things that you're interested in. Cool, next. Um, I think you can probably jump through the next few slides because these are just um, the personal types of personal projects that, uh, that we can recommend. Yep. Yeah, so I think, oh, sorry, can you go back one more slide? Yeah, correct. So there are also other types and uh, fields that you might be interested in, things like machine learning, right? If you're interested in getting to AI machine learning, um, there is platforms like Kaggle where you can participate in competitions to uh, really build that portfolio for yourself. Um, other platforms like competitive programming, for example, if you're interested in, do, um, in doing competitive programming, you can uh, go on websites like Codeforces and, and practice your, your skills. And even in cybersecurity, if you're interested, you can also explore things like capture the flag, um, capture the flag competitions. Um, and these are all different ways to kind of build the portfolio that you have uh, for yourself, right? Uh, next. Yeah, um, I think another component of the process, much like resume writing, is also the, the process of writing a cover letter. So um, writing the cover letter. So if you... Um, so sometimes the cover letter is not particularly uh, necessary in the application, and if it's not necessary, you will have to you will have to uh, choose not to submit the uh, the cover letter, basically, right? And most of the time, the cover letter requires quite a bit of attention to it. So if it's not required, we don't really recommend including it um, as well. Yeah. Uh, next, please. Yeah, that's it. Uh, yeah. So I think now I'll be passing on my time to Ben. 
we'll be talking more about the preparation component um, of the interview process. Yeah, thanks, Jia Hao. Um, yeah, so I'll be talking more about preparing for interviews. Next. Yep, next. Yeah, so usually how a recruitment process for a typical work for a tech company would typically look like is that there'll be an OA, which is like an online assessment where you have to solve like certain programming questions within a specified time limit. And if you pass that OA, you will move forward to the next round of interview, which is usually like one to two rounds of technical interviews. So doing the technical interviews, right, they will usually access like your algorithmic problem solving ability, like your ability to solve algorithmic questions. Um, and these questions can either be accessed via live coding, so you'll be required to live code a solution from scratch, um, or you can be asked to like articulate your thought process through like whiteboarding. So below are like some useful technical guides that you might want to consider um, to prepare for these kind of technical interviews. So like tech, the tech interview handbook was written by Yang Shun, which is a uh, ex engineer who's a uh, ex engineer at Meta, and then there's also Asana, and there's also like um, Jia Hao's like technical interview study guide as well, which you can use uh, for your preparation. Next. Yeah, so there are other types of technical interviews. So there's stuff like system design. But in my opinion, I feel like system design questions are not usually asked for interns. These are questions that are reserved for more like, senior engineers. Um, but of course, they might be a bit more relevant if let's say you're interviewing for like infra or like DevOps related role. Of course, there are other types of in technical interviews like in implementation, live coding, bug hunting, where they essentially give you like a pre-existing code base. And this code base can either be like riddled with bugs and you are required to like debug the code base to squash out all the bugs. Or you could be asked to actually implement like a feature from scratch, basically to extend a feature from the existing code base. Some companies um, also like to give take-home assignments. So the Complexity of the take-home assignments can vary. They can vary from as simple as creating a simple front-end or creating like a full-stack um, web application consisting on the front-end, back-end, and the database. And I think like a common class of questions that um, has been appearing lately is like the tech fundamentals question where they were actually, where the interviewers on the other side of the table will ask you like common CS trivia questions. So um, questions that span across like a huge, a wide spectrum of topics like networking, operating systems. So I think one of the questions that I got like quite commonly asked during interviews was like, what happens when you enter a URL into your browser, right? So this, this question was sort of like, that's your knowledge on like DNS, DNS resolver, and like, um, do you know like how IP addresses and how like networking works in general? Yeah, next. Yeah, so the general philosophy for interview preparation is to practice, right? There's no like shortcut um, to this. And, I mean, doing lead code questions consistently definitely helps, but you don't really have to kick yourself over it. You don't have to do like five or six a day. Honestly, just two to three per weekend is enough because the reason is that you want to get yourself into the mental space of like interviewing. And which also brings me to my next point when doing mock interviews with friends is actually quite helpful and quite important as well because, um, I mean, I've heard instances where, where people like solve the question during the technical interview, but they still but they were not able to like progress to the next round. And the reason being is that like, um, even though they were able to solve the problem in the end, right, they were not able to like articulate their thought process. They were, they were not able to like walk the interviewers through the solution. So honestly, I feel that that aspect, that ability of being able to bring the interviewers like from the problem to the solution, is actually, it's actually more important than solving the problem itself, right? Because it showcases your ability to communicate. It showcases your ability to be able to articulate your problems and to make sure like other engineers understand like um your thought process so definitely doing more interviews will help and i think the last tip is like don't avoid difficult questions right so um i think because if you always solve like easy questions and if you never like actually try to think about the difficult questions like liquid hearts right you will never actually improve you will never like be pushed beyond your comfort zone so like the only way to improve the only way to deepen like your algorithmic problem solving ability is to actually try hearts and of course if you get stuck it's fine it's completely fine right i mean that's the point of hearts is to challenge you and so that you can learn as much as possible yeah so and that's that next yeah so ultimately the entire process process is exhausting i mean for sure right i mean this this field is very very competitive but it is important i mean it's a necessary evil you can't run away from it and the good thing is that the more interviews you do like the more technical interviews you do the more algorithmic problems that you solve right over time it will get easier yeah Next.
So sometimes, um, sometimes like an interview may may not just have like a technical interview portion. They might also like perform resume deep dives. So where the interviewer on the other side of the table will actually ask you more about your experiences at your previous internships. Like what, what do you do? And like, um, and you'll be asked to elaborate more lah, on the work that you did and your contributions to the company. So I think to prepare for like this kind of like resume deep dive questions, it will be good to sort of like reread your resume and to really um, sit back and to recall things like what you have done and what are some of the engineering problems that you have faced at a point, what are some alternatives that you can, that you have considered and why do you eventually go on with like the engineering solution that you had in mind, right? So I think these are all like important aspects that you can consider um, when preparing like your answer uh, for the interview questions. Yeah, next. Yeah, so um, as previously mentioned, right, usually how a recruitment process for a tech company will typically look like is that like there will be an OA, then there'll be one to two rounds of tech. There will be one to two like rounds of technical interviews. And some companies, right, may also have like a behavioral round, like at the end of the technical interviews. And this is what they commonly do, common, this is what they commonly do refer as like as um culture fit rounds, culture fit rounds with the hiring managers. And obviously, usually it's not that hard to pass behavioral rounds. Because the point of these behavioral rounds is to spot like any potential red flags. But I think it's still important to prepare for such behavioral rounds. And usually what people use is they use a star format, right? So the situation, task, action, result. So you basically structure your answer according to this. So that like um uh interviewers will know like what do you do? Like, to, like let's say if there's a conflict or if that if or if there's like um certain failure that you got or like a setback, like how they want they want to know like how do you overcome this certain setback. Um, below are also some um, hyperlink resources that you can check out to actually prepare for behavioral rounds as well. I think the best tip for preparing for behavioral rounds is to really recall like your previous involvements and to really rehearse your answers for like certain class of questions. So for instance, if the interviewer asks, asks you like, um, what is, how, what is the conflict that you face during work and like how do you resolve it, right? So what I what I'll typically do is that I will like have like different paragraphs like rehearse and memorize to tackle like different classes of questions. Yeah, so that I'll be able to communicate um, my answers effectively to the interviewer so that I wouldn't waste a lot of time stuttering. Yeah, next. Yeah, so that is a lot of stuff. Uh, next. But, <clears throat> but I think honestly, it's important to just take it one step at a time, right? <clears throat> there's no need to like rush through the entire like preparations phase. And there's no better time to start than right now. Because right now, I think, I think the next, like for next summer application cycle will usually open in like August to September. So from now till like that period, we have we are looking at a runway of like three to four months, which I feel is more than enough time to actually brush up on experience, to brush up on your um interviewing, interviewing skills, to brush up on whatever you need to be to secure that um summer internship that you want. Yeah. Next. Yeah, so the next step. Um, come August 2023 is to actually apply for internships. Next. So usually the process of applying for internships is very easy. You simply enter like your particulars, like your name, your date of, uh, sorry, your name, your contact number, your email, you upload your resume. And usually you will, up, you will go to like the company's website. So let's say if I want to um, internet like Spotify. So you go to the Spotify website and then they, they will usually have like a career page, which you can um, navigate to, to actually fill up all your details. Next. But now the question is like, where do I find internship internships, right? So usually there are a lot of job aggregator websites. So I think LinkedIn is one prominent example. Um, I think internsg.com is also another website that people use to find internships. Um, yeah, and also I think there's also a quite a good GitHub repository. Yeah, the SG Tech Companies, which is um, which is like a repository, right? With all of like okay, not all like with a lot of the tech companies in Singapore, which you can consider applying to as well. Um, and I also want to bring attention to Simplify. So Simplify is also like, so beyond like a job aggregator, right? Simplify is this, is this Chrome extension that helps you like autofill like application forms. So meaning like you can actually apply to more companies um, per unit time, like more effectively. So instead of like, I think some companies actually use this thing called Workday. So Workday where you actually have to create an account you have to create an account just to apply to the company, which is it takes up a lot of time. So I think one hack that you can consider um, is to use the Simplify extension because this, like you just fill in 
how, how this simplify works is that you just fill in like all your details into this extension and this extension will basically like vegetate all like all of the information that you upload there onto the respective careers website. So you don't have to waste time like filling up the forms. Yeah. Next. Another source uh, in which you can find internships is like career fairs. So I think just earlier this year, I think School of Computing actually organized a career career fair where there were quite a few companies there. There were like DSDA, there was Kaladan. Um, yeah, so I think these career fairs are like good opportunities for you to actually to be able to interact with the recruiters and to really understand more about the work that they do and the opportunities that they offer. CFG also organizes many ad hoc events um, for internships as well, for tech internships. And I think hackathons, honestly, is a great way um, to also find opportunities. Um, I think hackathons like NUS Hack and Roll, um, there, there were a lot of sponsor booths and there were recruiters, there were the engineers who actually worked there. So it really gives you like the opportunity to really talk to the engineers to understand like um, some of the problems that they solve like doing work, which I thought was quite um, interesting as well. Next. Yeah, so um, honestly, if let's say if you're looking for a startup, you might think it's a bit challenging to find, but usually what people do is that you can actually go to like a VC firm. So like VC firm like Sequoia Capital, Kleiner Perkins, like all those big venture capital firms. And you can take a look at like the portfolio companies. So the companies that they have actually backed, right? And the reason, and the fact that if they are backed by like these big VCs, if these startup startups are backed by these VCs, right? It means like these startups are like quite good, right? So it's definitely worth applying to them. Um, yeah, so that's an, a source. That's like a possible area in which you can find internships. Um, oh, there's also you can also find internships like startups at like Block Seventy One, um, which is like an incubator for like local tech startups. It's somewhere in One North. Um, if you're looking for research adjacent internships, I think you can consider looking at like um conferences, CS research conferences, for example, like ACM conferences. Yeah. Next. Um, and honestly, like. If you want to find internships, right, you can just look at like your everyday life, right? You, you unlock your phone and then you see like all of the apps that you have on your phone. Like, I mean, you have Spotify, right? So usually there should be a Spotify internship or let's say if you are, um, or like Apple, I mean, you're using an Apple iPhone, right? That means Apple probably need, need, needs interns, right? So, and I think like, um, I think personally for me, like when I was applying for internships, because I'm actually a holder, I'm a programmer. So I actually look at some of the developer tools that I use. So for instance, like MongoDB. So MongoDB also has internships, Docker, um, GitHub, they all have internships, right? So I think you really, you can just look at like your everyday life to see like, hey, if there is this company, there's a chance that they might need interns, right? Yeah, so that's, uh, that's how you can actually look for internships. Next. Yeah, so basically you search the company name and then you suffix like whatever company name with the internship. And then usually you'll be redirected to the form. Yeah, next. Yeah, so um, so where to find experience, right? So in this regard, the School of Computing can actually help. So there are like open source projects available at SOC, which you can contribute. And I think open source is a great way for you to like learn because um, um, because the code base is like open source by everyone, right? right? And because it's open source. The fact that it's open source, right? It means like your code will be open to the public, will be avail available by review by anyone. So um, definitely this presents like an opportunity to learn a lot, especially from like more senior like holders. Um, CVWO is also, is also like um, another opportunity that you can offer, that you can consider as Orbital. Um, now another thing that I want to bring attention to is the NUS Venture Initiation Program. So I think, um, so this is more, kid, this is more, for those who are planning to pursue their own startups. So this NUS VIP program, the Venture Initiation Program, is essentially like an initiative by NUS Enterprises to actually help students fund their entrepreneurial pursuits. So I think they offer like 10K, like a 10K cash run over like a 12 month period. Yeah, so um, that's something that you can consider if you're planning to launch your own startup. And I think, yeah, NUS Overseas College, NOC, and I think, it's quite good as well because like it gives you like a chance to intern at the startup while overseas. So that's quite fun as well. Next. Oh, referrals. Um, so referrals help. I mean, they certainly help in getting your food in the door, but there's definitely not, they're definitely not like necessary. Lah. Um, if you really want referrals, right, you can usually ask like seniors. I mean, the worst that can happen is like they reject your request, right? Um, yeah, but I wouldn't really count so much on referrals because honestly, 
Raffles can only get you so far ahead. It can only get you like towards the first interview. Um, in the end, you, you will still need to be competent. You will still need to be able to solve the questions in the technical interview to be eventually hired, right? Next. Yeah, so rejections. I mean, rejections is completely normal. It's part and parcel of applying for internships. I mean, I mean, me and Xiaohao, we have our own fair share of like rejections of internships. So it's completely normal. Next. And definitely everyone struggles a lot, right? Um, it is definitely not easy to find like an internship, especially in like in this season, uh, where the market is actually quite, it's not the best in the best condition. But the key thing to note, right, is that you only need one offer. Yeah, that's all you need. Next. And honestly, getting an offer is, is a combination of both skill and luck. You have to be, I mean, you first of all, you have to be skilled, right? You have to be able to be, you need to be able to like answer the interview questions and you also need a, a bit of luck, right? Let, let, let's say the company happens to be looking for someone like you, for someone with your kind of experience. Next. Yeah, and I think one thing that I also want to re reiterate is like, is that like a rejection is not reflective of your worth as an engineer, right? It doesn't necessarily mean that you're not skilled enough, you're not good enough, or you're not knowledgeable enough. All it means, right, is that it's it's simply a mismatch between your skills or, and what, what you can offer between what the company needs. Yeah, so it's simply like you're just not at the right place and not, not at the right time. So like you don't have to think too much of a rejection. If you get rejected, just move on. So ultimately, right, it's, it's a bar, it's not a race. So you don't really have to compare to like anyone. Yeah. So um, I think the mental model to adopt in this case, next, is like a problem solving a mindset um, where you try to be resourceful in terms of like sourcing for internships, sourcing for opportunities. Yeah. Being able to find opportunities where like what people can't find. Um, yeah. So lastly, let's say if you get an offer, congratulations. Um, but getting an offer is not the end. Instead, it is the beginning to an end, right? Thanks. Because ultimately, you still want to maximize your internship experience, right? Um, so I think some general tips to actually maximize your internship experience is actually dog fooding. So meaning you poke around like the end product, the product as though as an end user. You try to find edge cases. You try to find um, certain faults with the system. Um, and I think... Um, point two, point three, and point four actually come hand in hand where you actually try to take notes about how systems work, where you try to talk to like your full-time engineers or you try to, en and you try to engage with the code base actively. Because I think um, when you are at internship, right, you are at the company and you will have access to the company code base. And I think this is something that's quite valuable because you, because this will like open your eyes. This will expose you to like the various software engineering practices that companies adopt internally. Which um, which is something that you don't learn at school. So definitely treasure this, treasure this opportunity to like soak in to absorb as much as possible. And let's say if you don't understand like a certain thing, let's say if you look at let's say if you're like starting this part of the code base and like this component doesn't really make sense, definitely talk to like your mentors, mentor engineers, or like your full time engineers to really understand like what's going on. And I think um an interesting point is like thinking about the business impact. Um. I think as an engineer, you, we usually don't think about the business impact of like pushing our code or like pushing our feature into production because um, like as engineers, right, what, what we need to do is to simply write the code, turn the code out and like whatever the product manager wants. But I think what will really make you stand out from like other engineers right, is to think about the business impact, think about like the impact where um, of like what your code has on the general public or like and the, on the end product. Yeah, so I think that will make you like more like multi-dimensional as opposed to like a one-dimensional one-dimensional engineer. Um, building relationship. Of, of, I mean, building relationships is quite important. It's all about like networking. So being able to like um network with like a full timers because who knows, right? You never know when they might come in useful. Um, like in the next opportunity or like let's say if you want to convert your internship to a full time, you never know like when um they might actually be helpful in this regard. And then the last key thing is to ask for feedback frequently. And I think this is actually quite important. Um, I think usually when you intern at like big companies, right, there will usually be like one-to-one -one review sessions. So like the intern and like um and like a senior engineer 
catch up or like there can be weekly catch ups. And I think it's crucial to make use of these sessions to actually um, ask the engineer about your progress and ask about to really get feedback like, on how you're doing and how can you actually perform better doing the internship. Because ultimately, right, doing the in doing the internship, they don't, they don't really expect you to contribute much. Honestly, you're there to learn because I mean, compared, compared to like the full time engineers with like 10, 20 years of experience, like an intern wouldn't be able to um, do much. Yeah, so I think the important thing is to really ask for feedback and to really uh, use this experience to grow. Yeah, next. Okay, so, so some alternatives, if you don't secure an internship, it's not necessarily the end of the world. Next. Some of the, like, well, so, some stuff that you can consider pursuing is like your own project, your own startup, or you can consider like undertaking like a research opportunity like you URLP, be, or you can both consider doing open source, like some of code or like NUS mods. Um, and honestly, you don't really have to, you, you don't have to feel pressure to do any of this. You can like take the time to really breathe and relax, right? Because I mean, um, there's always like next year to apply for an internship. You don't have to do something like this year. Yeah, next. Okay, so some um, parting final thoughts, next. So as mentioned uh, multiple times during this presentation, this process is extremely emotionally exhausting and tiring, right? I mean, it definitely is not easy. Um, rejections are part and parcel and like it's easy to feel disappointed it's easy to feel depressed after every single rejection but the key thing to note is that like your friends are going through it, through it with you like you are going through it together so um, talk to them help each other out and obviously there are groups like Project Intern um, where people are hunting for internships together yeah so um, and there's also no such thing as not being prepared enough Right. I mean, every position that you don't apply to is a definitely rejected, right? You miss every shot that you don't take. So honestly, preparation just involves like accumulating learnings, going for interviews, um, learning like your shortcomings. Because I think doing interviews, right, is where you actually get access, where you actually know what you don't know. So I, that's, why I, that's why what I usually do is that I just apply for everything that I see. Yeah, because... um. I mean, even go, going for interviews or companies that you're not really keen on is still a learning opportunity, in my opinion. Yeah, and I would, I'd like, I would like to end off with this quote. It's like, opportunity is when luck meets preparation. Yeah, so it helps to be sufficiently prepared, but it does take a bit of luck to secure um, whatever you want. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we have come to the end of the presentation, and I think we will be taking a five-minute break uh, from now. Yeah, so see you guys back at 7.48. Yeah, okay. So um hello hello everyone. Uh welcome back. So uh now before we actually progress on to like the panel discussion, um we'll we'll be answering some questions that some people have um on the regarding the presentation earlier on. So the first question is what is the usual timeline for applying some of the internships for the next year? Um so for big com I mean it varies from companies to companies, right? So usually startups have a like a shorter application cycle. Usually yeah. the applications open uh open like nearer to May. So maybe like we're looking at January to Feb. But for like big companies, so like banks, big tech, they will usually open um from August, September, October, like in that range. So usually like like it's like a good like nine months before May. Yeah. Yeah, um, so that's how the timeline looks like um, for applying tech internships.
how to prepare for CS fundamental questions. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, I mean, definitely the questions that they can ask, right, they definitely span across like a wide spectrum of topics. But I think, um, I mean, for, for me, how I actually prepared for like these kind of questions, because I'm a year one, so I haven't taken like the relevant mods uh, for like networking and OS. So what I did was I actually um, went to YouTube and then um, usually there's like a lot of YouTube channels which which uploads like bite-sized videos, bite-sized videos of like OS, networking. And I think those are generally sufficient because they're very visual and they're very short, they're very bite-sized. So it's very easy to like digest the stuff in those videos as opposed to like watching like lectures by like universities. Yeah, so I think that's, and honestly watching like a few videos, not even a few videos, like one video every every few days is more than sufficient. Yeah. I mean, that's for me, that's how I prepare. Yeah. And, on, and honestly, it's also like a matter of luck. That, so like, if the questions that they ask happen to be something that you know, then you're in luck. If not, yeah, then too bad, yeah. Yeah, um, that's all for me. Um, does Jia Hao have anything else to add? Uh, not really. I think for the fundamentals, probably just good to uh, look for online resources, as Ben mentioned. And also, some of these concepts tend to be those that you can learn as you build things, like work on projects. Like network fundament networking fundamentals tend to be one of the more common ones. So try to experiment with projects and play around with the concepts as well to kind of get a better grasp for it. Oh, and I think that's the end of the quest the questions um for the presentation. And I think now we will move on to the panel discussion. Um and Truck from core team will be facilitating facilitating the panel discussion. Um, hi, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Prakam. I am in, I'm in year one computer science, and I am also part of NUS Hackers, just as Ben and Jiahao. So I'll be facilitating the panel discussion for today. And before we start, of course, let's introduce the panelists. So the first panelist we have is Johanna. Um, Johanna, do you mind introducing yourself? Oh yeah. Um, hi everyone. So I'm Johanna. I graduated um, two years ago and now currently I'm working in Google Singapore, specifically for Google Pay for India. That's that's great. Um, it's good to have you on our panel, Johanna. Um, next on the panel is Revat, uh, Revat Shah. Um, do you mind introducing yourself if you're on if you're in the meeting um hey sure am i audible enough yeah you're audible okay great uh, hi everyone my name is raivat or you can call me rai uh, i'm currently working for an edtech startup called flint it's based in the bay area but i'm working remotely uh, previously i've interned at like bigger tech firms like garina and paypal and after that i've mostly worked at startup firms uh, i'm in us class of 2022 Looking forward to the discussion. That's nice. It's good to have you on the panel, Robert. Next, we have Jolie Fong. Um, Jolie, if you're there, you, could you introduce yourself, please? Hi, everyone. I am Jolie. I'm currently working as a quant trader at DRW, which is a proprietary trading firm. Uh, I graduated from SMU last year, actually. So the funny thing is that I don't have any engineering background. Mine is more of a finance, math kind of background. Uh, and I tried a whole bunch of stuff before settling on quant finance, interned in marketing, interned in a law firm, um, did some math and machine learning research. Yeah, that's me. That's quite interesting. It's good to have you on our panel. Um, next, we've got Steven. Um, Steven, would you like to introduce yourself? Can you hear my voice clearly? Uh, yeah, you're audible. Oh, okay. 
Cool. Yeah, so hi everyone. I'm Steven. I graduated from NUS around like two years ago. And I'm currently working at a an early stage startup called Assembly in Singapore. And previously, I've also like interned at like several different types of company like Citadel Securities, Google, and C. Yeah. Looking forward that's to the nice. discussion. That's quite nice. Yeah, that's looking forward to the discussion too. And lastly, we have Jotham Wong. Um, so Jotham, would you like to introduce yourself? to our audience. Um, can you guys hear me? Uh, yeah, we can hear you now. Uh, yeah, so I'm an incoming fourth year student and I'm currently an intern at EPFL, it's a Switzerland university. And I'm like, doing research on like systems research. Yeah. Well, that's, that's cool, um, okay. All right, so these are all our panelists. Uh, it's good to have you here, and I hope, and I'm sure that uh, you'll be very. Your answers will be very, very informative and helpful to our audience today. So I'm going to start things off with a few questions that have been very frequently asked by nearly everyone, or at least a majority of people who are looking for internships. And this for, the first of these questions is this one right here. Uh, should I diversify my internship experience with different roles or should I be specializing in one specific role? So this question, again, uh, all the questions will be open to anyone on the panel. You can feel free to step up and answer and feel free to add on to anyone else's answers. So yeah, this is the first question. Does anyone want to take it? No? All right, um, Jotham, what do you feel about this? Uh, I guess I feel like the optimal play is always to diversify your internship experience. So like the question you should ask yourself is what is the purpose of an internship, right? And it is something you do before you start your career proper. And the whole point of an internship is to find out what you enjoy and don't enjoy, what kind of company culture you vibe with and don't vibe with, for example. So like for my personal context, I, my first internship was at ASTAR as a machine learning uh, intern. And I already kind of knew I wanted to do research, whether I was a researcher or a professor. And I liked the vibes that I had for my internship, but I still went to go for some engineering internships in big tech and some, uh, a finance firm to find out the, the kind of work that I uh, wanted to do. And I think Jia Hao mentioned earlier that one thing that you did you should consider is the purpose of the company. And I think that the purpose is perhaps the most important thing because it's like the fulfillment you get from your career. So personally for me, I didn't really enjoy doing uh, engineering work as much because I feel that at a certain point, it's like repetitive and I prefer the uncertainty that comes with research. So that's why I'm like so-called committed towards a research position now. So I guess... If somehow you're very fortunate to have found something you're very passionate about, even in year one, you should still try to take on as many diverse internship roles as you can, because you never know if the next internship you take, you, you enjoy that work a lot more, or say you prefer a startup culture more. So I think that the ideal meaningful way to experience university is to intern at a research lab, a startup, and a big tech firm, for example, or a finance firm. Like just get as much exposure as you can and like these big four things and like you will find out uh, a meaningful career essentially yeah that's my answer for that. yeah uh, yeah that's yeah what do you say it does make sense i think it is i think it is a good idea to try and get diverse viewpoints uh and uh, more ideas about what different roles at different types of companies actually entail and whether or not this is a good fit for you so yeah you do make good points there um, does anyone else have anything they'd like to add on? Uh, maybe Raivat, do you have anything to add on? Um, no, I think my views are very similar to what uh, Jotham mentioned. Uh, I think it's rare to know what you really want to do, but I think if you really want to do something and you're really sure about it, then I think there's nothing wrong in specializing in one specific role. But I agree that I think in general for most people, especially when you're in year one, I think you should try to experience as many things 
um, as possible so that you really know for sure what you want to do. Uh, and it's possible even after exploring these things that you don't know what you want to do. So I think the overall strategy that he mentioned makes a lot of sense. Uh, one thing to realize, I think, is also that uh, it's not only summers that you can go for internship. I'm not sure if it was covered in the discussion earlier, uh, but yeah, there are LOAs and there are other ways uh, to do stuff even outside of summers. Hmm. Yeah, that's, you bring up a good point, actually. So people often think your internships are limited to the summer, but no, you can actually extend beyond the summer. There are various programs by OSSV that allow you to do so. Uh, even other faculties, if anyone is from any other faculty or university, I'm sure they'll have programs as well. And uh, yeah, winter internships are also a thing. You may want to do an internship in the middle of your semester as well. So anything goes, really. So yeah, you do bring up some good points there. Uh, thank you, Ravad. Uh, we'll move on to the next question now. So what we what were some of your top considerations when applying for internships and why? Anyone like to, would like to take this? Maybe Johanna? Okay. Um, so I think this is um, very specific to basically what you want for. So I, I can share what I personally consider. So for me, it's like first one is like the learning opportunity. Um, for example, um, like whether I am able, I'll be able to like get guidance during the internship and whether the scope of the um, projects would be um, good because um, sometimes um, they specify some of these things um, in their requirements. Um, but if not, um, you can consider whether you want to apply for like big tech internships or like startups. Because for me, um, I for me I prefer um internship with more structure, which um usually come with like um big tech companies. Um, so I guess like learning opportunity and like structure are like one of the two a eh, two of the top considerations that um I use for myself. And then, for example, if um, the salary matters to you, um, I guess, yeah, you can try to apply to like, um, yeah, certain companies that you know would pay like um, better and so on. So um, the considerations really depend on what you personally um, want, basically. Yeah. But maybe the other panelists can like add more colors to it as well. Yeah, sure. Uh, it'd be good to have more viewpoints on this question because, again, as Jana mentioned, different people will probably have different considerations. So, does anyone have any other different categories they want to add on to this? Yeah, I'll uh, jump in here. Uh, oh, sure. Okay. I'll go. I think the question to to be asking is like, what's your target audience right now? It's like year ones and pre university freshmen. So honestly, you shouldn't have any considerations about what internships to apply for. You should apply to everything. Yeah. And then based uh, off the offers that you do get, then you factor in what offer you want to take. Yeah. Um, like what Jonas answer, I think, is more suited when you have got more experience and stuff in your resume, I guess. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I, I agree. I think when you're just starting out, you shouldn't have too many considerations uh, that, that you want to take into account. But again, Project Intern is actually open to not just pre-uni and year ones, but also year twos, year threes, and even year fours who are looking for in summer internships to, for instance, help them with the graduation requirements. So that's why this question is there. It's, it applies to people who are also, who may have a little bit of internship experience under their belt already and may want to actually uh, add, add more experience. Um, so thank you. And Jovi, sorry, you got cut off in the middle there. So would you like to add on something? Oh, no, I just added, I uh, wanted to add one point on, I think, mentorship. So a lot of, uh, I think a lot of like what you get after internship also depends on the people you're working with, not only just the projects you do, but like, how is your manager, right? Like, is your manager someone who uh, is actually like skilled enough and willing and able to give you the growth and the support you need to really make the most out of this internship like there are some managers out there who are really really good at what they do they are rock stars but they're just bad at managing people so in that case like you as a junior like you might not get as many opportunities uh like if you 
only like work with people that are like that uh, basically mm. yeah that's a that's actually a good thing to consider the work environment of your company does matter a lot towards your internship experience it's not just the salary and maybe the prestige of that company right so w would you like to add on maybe something about how you can try and find out more about the company's work culture if you haven't already worked there before Mm, well, the easiest way to do that is during the interview. Like, you know, at the last part, they always ask you, do you have any questions mm -hmm. for me? That is your chance to interview the company as well. Ask them what are the mm -hmm. kind of projects I'll be working on? What is the culture like? How is your team structured? Things like that, that can, like their answers can give you certain clues about whether like it is a good place to work at or not. Mm, that's true. Yeah. And yeah, so talking to the interview at the end of the interview, because that section of the interview is there for a reason you it's there for you to query the company as jovi has very well said uh so thank you for your answers there um move on to the next question now are grades important for internships and what about for research internships so i'm pretty sure everyone has this question at the back of their minds oh my are my grades good enough am i is this you know good enough for getting into this company or that company. And I think this will be a good idea to address that on a wider platform. So does anyone would, uh, want to take this question? Um, okay, I think for most like tech companies, my understanding is grades are important only to a certain extent. Um, I understand, I think some companies like cut off um, their applicants like at a certain um, cap, but I think most they do not really do that. Um, I think I can speak for Google. I think for Google, like they don't um grades as long as your grades are not that bad. Um, I I know people who like got uh, like the cap is like below four out of five, and they can still get accepted. Um, so in that sense, grades are not that important for um for some companies. Yeah, but maybe other um, panelists can add on as well. Yeah. Um... I think for research internships, like grades are the most important thing. Like, but mm. like the bar would be like 4.5 or something if you're from NUS, I guess. So like my personal context is I've spoken to a bunch of professors because I'm very into research. And I guess the general idea is that like they consider a filter of like 4.5. And then after that, it kind of doesn't really matter. So it's like diminishing returns. But I would say a safe bet is like 4.8 or something. But the most important point is that you should be taking courses, be taking or have taken courses in the area that you want to intern under. So like if you want to do research in like machine learning, you should probably have achieved a good grade in 2109S or something equivalent. Yeah. Hmm. So... Correct me if I'm wrong, the reason why uh, grades are important in research internships is that in research, you're working with academia, so you need to have a very strong knowledge of the concepts that you'll actually be working with. And is it that grades are used as a very, uh, grades are actually a very suggestive tool of this, or is there a different reason to this? What would you, what would you I say? I think grades are like a relatively like, it's like a all right ish indicator of like your work ethic. Like it's like the higher your grades are, it's like more correlated that you're a hardworking student. Yeah. And at some point, like when you're doing all like research, like very like the whole point of research is like you're trying to answer questions that are unanswered, right? That no one knows the answers to. So you damn well be like like close to an expert in that field. I mean, you can't be 100 percent expert, but you should know a lot. And I guess, like, generally speaking, a good grade means that you know your content. Like, an A- minus or an A, maybe you made some careless mistakes here, but it reflects that you have some level of knowledge that the professor is looking out for. Yeah. Mm. I see. I see. Um, as going back to going away from research and back to just normal the tech, the normal tech industry, does anyone else have anything to add on about the importance of grades? Uh, maybe Steven, Steven, you haven't said anything so far. Oh, yeah, sure. I mean, in my experience, like applying to tens, yeah, maybe, I don't know, maybe 50 or something companies in the past, I never really like submitted my grades. Probably, okay, probably like some companies 
have like a field in their application form, probably just asking about like the overall GPA or cap. And then like probably I'll also like mention it as a in a few words in my resume. But that's all. Like nobody nobody ever asked me about like what were like the courses I that I had taken or like uh ask for my official transcript, except for like some special cases. Uh if you need to apply, let's say visa for like overseas internship or maybe like uh af for uh after you graduate if you want if you need visa to work uh somewhere then probably you need to submit like a uh, transcript for like the processing uh for the application process but usually that's the end after like you get the offer so yeah i don't think it really matters i think like what matters most is about more about like your experience about what you know about like the role you will be working as the domain uh Let's say if you are working in a network, uh, networking stuff, you need to know about like networking stuff. Or maybe if you are working in the area of like database, then probably you need about database. And yeah, I guess that's it. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. That that does make sense. And so yeah. So the overall consensus I'm getting is that in the tech industry overall, uh, grades are not too important. Although there are a few companies that do have a cutoff for grades. Is not taken too seriously at the most it may or may not be included on your resume and that's up to you right so that's the consensus that i'm getting uh so far and yeah let's move on to the next question so i think this is quite an interesting question really uh so how different is startup culture from big tech culture really the working culture working environment in startups versus big tech I think, Johanna, you can probably give a little bit on this from the big tech point of view, at least. Okay. Um, I think the first thing would be the pace. Um, usually, the startup culture would be more fast-paced than um, big tech. So um, the running joke in Google is like, um, Google is very slow because like there are many um, steps that you need to do to be able to launch. Um, but this also means that there is more uh, by launch, I mean like launch a feature to like production, for example. Um, but this also means that um, there is more structure um, in big tech. So if it's a culture that you like, um, everything has like their own um, ordering of steps, then yeah, maybe um, big tech is more for you. And um, I guess what I'll... Uh, what I can share more is, um, I think in startup, or correct me if I'm wrong, Stephen, maybe, <laughs> like um, you do more things, um, but in big tech, like your role is more um, specific. So maybe in startup, um, you'll be doing um, um, development and then QA testing everything yourself. But in big tech, um, there will be another team who will be doing the QA. So um, yeah, I think that's the biggest difference. Yeah. In Maybe yeah, other... yeah. Uh, so thanks for your viewpoint. So you mentioned startup culture a little bit, and Revath and Stephen, both of you can jump in here. I think it'd be interesting to hear from the startup side of things now. How sure, yeah. culture oh. there? Okay, yeah, maybe I can uh, help to add my opinion here. I think it's not really about like the startup culture, or, like big tech culture. In my opinion, it's more about like the team culture usually because like probably like 80 to 90% of the time you'll be working with your team. Uh, and like even like uh, some big tech companies can have like the so-called startup culture and like some startups probably if many of the people come used to uh, used to work at like big companies, they can sort of have like some big tech vibes as well. So it uh, I'd say it depends more on the team, but probably like uh, in my experience, uh, one of the most significant differences of is of course like around like the process, the ops, uh, like in a big big company, like Joanna said, maybe uh you have like more structure because you know you are dealing with larger user base or so there's like more risk if something goes wrong. I mean if you if Google goes down then like millions or or like billions of people will notice. Meanwhile, if a startup goes down, then I mean I mean like the service goes down, then probably only a few will notice the uh, the users. So uh, there are definitely like more ops involved in a big tech. Like if you want to release something to production or maybe like the process, uh, the testing or whatever. 
but I think like most of the time, uh, it depends more about like the team culture and the team culture itself. I mean, you can dis you can discover them when you interview with the team, or uh, yeah, you when you get uh, I mean, if you knew if you know someone who works in a company, then you can probably like get a rough sense of how they are working, their culture and stuff. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, that's quite interesting, actually. I myself don't know too much about startup culture, and it was interesting to hear from you about how startup culture actually is. Um, Reva, do you have anything else you want to add to this, or do you think that's a pretty good representation of startup culture? Uh, yeah, I think what both of them said makes a lot of sense. Uh, yeah, I think in general, the startup side of things, I think that can also vary. So it depends on what stage of the startup the startup is at. So you can have let's say a very pre-revenue, very small team startup versus a startup that has raised quite a bit of funding and is quite like close to um, an IPO or an exit or whatever, right? So I think the smaller a, comp like the smaller a startup is, really, the more informal it is. And I think uh, as Joanna mentioned, uh, the, the more uh, wide the role can be. So I think one thing, two things that could be certain is uh, you could be expected to do things that are not specifically in your job scope because for a startup, it makes sense to get things done. Uh, and the speed of execution that Joanna mentioned, I think for a startup, it's really important to move fast, usually in tech. So that'll be a key focus. Uh, and another thing is, yeah, the smaller a company is, the more informal, I guess, the processes will be, right? Let's say, let's say if you're interviewing at a startup that is like quite big, let's say about a hundred employees, they might have processes that uh, a 10 employee startup will not have. Right. So I think that is like a spectrum to be aware of, like the smaller the company, usually uh, the more informal and unstructured it will be. But regardless, I think one uh, key difference that that will be there, uh, which Joanna kind of hinted on, is I think because of the lack of processes and otherwise, there'll be a lot more ambiguity in a startup culture than um, in a big tech culture. Right. So if let's say you are someone who wants to plan things weeks or months in advance, right, that that that's more related to big tech, uh, whereas in startup, things can change week by week or even midweek. Uh, so it's yeah, it's it's about dealing with a lot of ambiguity for sure. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's quite interesting. Again, um, seems to be a somewhat of a consensus on how different startups and big tech are but also uh both Revat and Steven brought up an important point that it could be uh it could also depend from company to company sometimes a startup may behave more, more like a big tech or a big tech may behave more like a startup and that really depends on the company as well so and yeah I think yeah, it's oh sorry yes, just yes, to add on I think it it depends on like the domain as well so I mean I used to work at like some uh internal tools as well uh, at like big companies and I mean when you are only working on like internal tools usually like it's easy as well I mean you can also like move papers because like you know if something uh, breaks then yeah probably only like the internal people will care about it which is like not a big deal as compared to like if the cus the actual customers of the company that hmm. actually notice the issue so yeah your domain matters as well like the the team the domain yeah hmm. Yeah, that's quite an interesting point, actually. Uh, thanks, Stephen. Um, okay. Uh, so for now, uh, we'll sort of put a hit pause on these preset or these pre-prepared questions that we had, and we'll actually order, answer a few of the audience's questions because we have quite a few, actually, and quite a few interesting ones, even. So the first one is, I think, at least to me, is a little bit relatable um, may or may not be relatable to you guys maybe and many members of the audience seem to like this question a lot so for a live coding interview what if we get stunned by the questions or maybe you're unable to come up with a solution right so is it immediately like a red mark against you is it like one foot out the interview door um, I think this question has to do with sort of interview knobs as well as what happens if you're unable to solve a question at the interview so does anyone have any uh, advice about what to do in such situations and whether or not it'll affect you too strongly? Um, Jolie, maybe you can uh, say something about this. What happens if you can't solve a question during a live coding interview? 
Yeah, so if you give a coding interview or any kind of interview, maybe you pose the question that you have difficulty answering, right? Maybe you're not able to come up with a solution or you can't think on the spot, or maybe a solution seems to have some errors in it, right? So how do you handle such a, such a situation, right? What, what do you think would be the best course of action for someone in this situation? Right. Uh, first off, don't panic because when you're nervous, then you start seeing stupid things and everything will just get worse from there on. And second off, I think if you have like some idea of how to solve the question, maybe like you're like 40% or even 15% there, right? Just walk the interviewer through your thought process, like detail, like detail, like step by step, how you're thinking about this problem. Right. So maybe they might give you a hint along the way that will actually help you, or maybe they won't. But at least if the interviewer knows that like you are making an effort and you can like demonstrate that you actually have thought about it, it's not a complete blank, right? Then uh I think you will be able to score some points there. In the scenario where like you look at the question, you completely don't know how to answer. It's happened to me a few times before. Um, I think like you can it's fine to ask for a bit of a hint on where to start like not not ask for the whole answer right but just ask like oh should I be thinking about it this way or should I be thinking about it the other way right so it's not so much about whether you can solve the problem in one shot or not right it's more about like your reasoning and the thought process that you have into it that's what these firms are looking for mm -hmm. That's quite interesting and honestly a little bit reassuring too that just because you don't have know this know the answer don't know the solution doesn't mean it's the end all for your interview. Uh, so to summarize, you're saying that it's a good idea to even if you don't have the entire answer to walk the interview through your thought process about how to get to how how you are thinking about the solution for the question. Am I right? Yeah, hmm. more or less. That's, it's like yeah. the idea that something is better than nothing always mm. Mm, that's true that's true um does anyone else have anything they want to add on to this maybe a particular situation you've been in before something like this um i don't know maybe johanna revat one of you actually i totally agree with what julie shared and yeah it happened to me many times as well and i think most of the times the engineers were kind enough to give hints as you um, share your thought process because um when you walk through uh, your thought process then when the um the interviewer spot like um where you go wrong then maybe from there you can like you pick up and then like maybe go towards the right um solution even if like you are unable to come up with a solution immediately, I think um it's still fine um as long as yeah eventually um you get there, um and yeah I think um yeah I also agree with what Jolie said about like asking for hints. I think like we are really afraid like of asking hints because that means like we are incapable of solving the questions. But mm -hmm. again, like it's still better than just like say I can't do this. Yeah. But maybe just phrase like, um, the way you ask for hints in a nice way. Yeah. So for example, um, yeah, um, this is what I'm thinking. Like, am I thinking in the right direction? Or like I'm not too sure how to um solve this particular part. Um yeah, do you have any suggestions on how to approach this? Yeah. Mm, that, yeah, that's yeah, I think that matches up quite well with Jolie mentioned before as to if you do have if you are having problems walking through the thought process one thing another thing is don't be afraid of the interview right you can you can ask them hence they're not going to eat you up if you do that right it's completely reasonable to ask them for a hint and you mentioned the phrasing as well uh i think that's a pretty good suggestion not one that many people would think of even if they did think of asking for a hint uh so you have to sort of phrase it in a way that the interview doesn't think that yeah this guy has no clue what's going on right that's basically what you're trying to do there even when you're asking for a hint um yeah. so thanks uh thanks for your input uh again i think it's really helpful and i think it'll really help to calm the nerves of our audience who are wondering whether they'll be able to answer the interview questions or not um 
Okay, another question, quite interesting. Uh, and this is related to a couple of similar questions. Um, how do you decide what type of companies you want to work in? I think this actually builds upon one of the previous questions. So how many, how do you decide what type of companies do you want to work in? Do you just follow quant, big tech startup? And what about government organizations? Does anyone have any um and anyone have any additional points they'd want to add? Because I think this is quite an interesting question. Somewhat similar to what we'd covered earlier, but maybe there's something that was missed out earlier. Mm. Maybe Revat, do you have anything to add? Um, yeah, sure. I think, yeah, as you said, it's very related to what we were just discussing about like big tech versus startup. So I think mm. uh, in deciding what you want, it'll be quite a mix of factors. So like, for example, compensation will be one of that. Uh, what is the area of work that you're doing? That can be part of um, that uh, decision. Who you work with, that is going to be um, part of that decision. So I think it's a very uh, personal decision to make. And in terms of how you decide, I think you have to decide what is important for you. Right? Let's say, for example, for a startup, you really like a startup. But usually, let's say in that particular startup, you know the work-life balance is uh, you know, not going to be as great as maybe it is in a bigger tech firm. Right? So then you will have to weigh for, for yourself personally, which is why internships are great. Uh, and which is why the point that we were talking about earlier about exploring everything, that is where you'll be able to have the most amount of information possible for you to make the decision. Um, and about government organizations, uh, I think, yeah, I've worked in one for a while. Uh, I think government organizations can also be great, especially in Singapore. I think in Singapore, some of the government organizations are doing really good work uh, that I would say the tech and the culture is at par or sometimes even better than what you can find in some startups and bigger tech firms. So I think for those of us in Singapore, uh, you can definitely consider them. Again, the choices will boil, boil down to, I think, personal factors of what you really want to do. Um, for me personally, I can walk, walk through mine. So for example, for me, uh, my internships were in usually in bigger tech companies. So but be, during those times, I learned a lot technically. So I was really grateful for that. But at the same time, I realized that I want to be uh, in a smaller tech firm because I want to be closer to impact. Like I want to see the impact of my work more clearly, as well as I also want to be in a culture which is more ambiguous, more unstructured than the structured uh, you know, environment that is offered in big tech, which is why I chose to like change track, uh, you can say, or you know, change course and then just go work at startups. So yeah, that's my uh, point of view. Hmm. That's that's actually quite interesting. We hadn't mentioned government organizations and it's a good thing that it was brought up in this question because Revat, you've given actually quite a good uh, quite a good insight into government organizations in Singapore. Um, does anyone else uh, else have anything to add on to this? Maybe I can help you at a little. So sure. yeah, I totally agree with Rivat. Like it all depends on what do you want to do in the long run. So that's why like I think it's important for uh everyone to understand like what matters to the uh to your own self the most. And uh I think like for me personally in the past, like I use most of my internships were sort of most were like in a bigger uh tech firms but like uh at the end uh at the end i chose to join like a startup i think like uh some of the reasons was because like i realized that the environment suit me the most out of like all my experience after like doing all the internships that's why like i think it's important to try like a bunch of like different uh companies uh when you have like the opportunity in school and one of the biggest privilege for like internship is that like internship it's just like three months. Meanwhile, if you have already if you have already like graduated and you change job every let's say three months or something, it will look really bad on your resume. So that's why like it's important when you have like the chance. I mean the privilege to you know try a bunch of like different things in in school to yeah just try them and see which one works the best. Yeah, yeah. I think this ties in well with our previous discussions as well, right? So. Think about what kind of work you want to do. And again, most people won't have too much of an idea of what they want to do. So it's a good idea to get some diversity within your uh, internship experiences, maybe try out different companies, different roles, see what you like, see what you don't like. And based on that, try and narrow down what you want to do in the future, 
right? So yeah, so thanks, Stephen and Revit for your views on this question. Um, the next question I think is quite relevant, quite pertinent to um, the current market situation. So what is your take on today's job market in the tech industry and how can students improve their chances of internships despite uh, all these layoffs? Um, anyone wants to step in and try and answer this? Um, well, Johanna, I know Google's had a lot of layoffs in the recent few years. So how do you, what do you think of this question? How, what do you think um, students can do to improve their chances? Mm, I think for internship, I guess it's really out of your controls. Um, if let's say you have applied and then you have been accepted and then because of the wave of layoffs, like they cancel your internship, I think that's really out of your control. But I can um, share the perspective of like the full timers, let's say, like um, how do they increase their chance? Maybe this is also applicable to you in a sense. So like make sure, like we are trying to make sure that what we do personally uh, make great impact such that they cannot really lay off you. So mm -hmm. in a sense as students, um, yeah, maybe, um, uh let, let me think sure sure I guess uh, perform meantime... yeah sorry um performing well um during the interviews um such that um they think that um or oh, you are such an asset that they cannot like um term, um can manage your um offer um would be great i would i i would guess um yeah because but if it really happens, like I feel like um you shouldn't feel bad about yourself. Like it's really like things that are outside of your control. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I think that's a pretty interesting point. So it's really not too much in your control at the end of the day. But what you can do is during the interview process and during the entire application process, make it seem like an amazing candidate. Like the hiring manager should think my god there's no way we can let this guy go you know so i i think yeah that makes that makes sense to me um another similar question how do you adapt to the current state of the market where many can't even find our first internship so i think this has more to do with the amount of com not only to do with uh the fact that uh, oh, there's all these layoffs happening in the industry but also uh the the fact that there's so much competition now in the market right there's so many students who are coming out looking for internships and even non-students who are trying to enter the industry and try, are looking for internships and competing with each other. So does anyone have any tips, any advice to with regards to this question? Um, yeah, I think this is a, a good natural follow-up to the previous discussion. In fact, I wanted to hint at this. Uh, so I think Joanna did a very good job at uh, suggesting how to navigate the interview process uh, specifically in this current market uh, but then I think yeah natural question is like how do you even get your uh, step into the door right and I think to answer the I mean the first part of the previous question I think yeah I think as Joanna said we shouldn't feel bad at all because this is one of the toughest market I think the industry has seen in history so mm -hmm. yeah I think no one should feel bad about um, themselves for uh, like not getting the foot in the door but at the same time now addressing this question uh, so for context I've done hiring for a bit uh, like hiring for interns and I was also an intern manager for a while uh, so just adding my uh, experience and viewpoints I was hiring in Singapore for an intern so I think my my personal take here is to have to stand out to really build proof of work so that can be done through projects, for example. And it's even better, let's say, if your products have users. They don't have to be paying users, but it's something that people use regularly uh, to solve a problem. Because I think, firstly, it signals to the hiring manager or whoever is on the other side of the table that you can build something on, on your own. A, you have initiative to do that. Uh, B, you can actually build something. Uh, and three, uh, it signals a, a kind of a strong or decent enough product sense as well that you know or find out um, what needs to be built and you go and build that. So I think that is a very strong signal to me and something that I have looked for and something I know that my friends who are in hiring positions 
uh, are hiring for positions also look for. So I think that that is a strong signal because if you think from a company's perspective, uh, the key question they are trying to answer is, uh, can this person do this job well in our team, in our company or whatever, right? And one key aspect of that risk is to see whether you're, you're capable enough to do that. Of course, like whether you can work in the team and everything is part of that, but foot in the door, let's say to get your resume passed up. If let's say you have a project there that has X number of users, it's, it's there, it's accessible on a domain uh, or it's a Telegram bot that is live and it works. I think that is a very, very good signal that sets you apart from uh, many other candidates because something I've seen uh, a lot, which is not bad per se, but doesn't look as great when you have uh, like like a person with a real uh, project is when people build tutorial apps. So if you, let's say, if you just do tutorial apps, that's great. That shows you can follow a tutorial, you can do the technical part, but it's not, I, I personally don't think it's as great as having uh, a product that people are using and some project, some project that is unique uh, that people want to use. Hmm. It's quite a good point. So even if, uh, let's say, you're not too successful in securing internships, or maybe you're just searching for internships, it's a good idea to be working on your own skill set, on your own projects to show interviewers, potential managers, as we hire hiring managers and companies that, you know, I can do this, I have done this, and here's some proof. Yes, it's a very good point, really. Um, does anyone ha else have uh, anything they'd like to add on to this one? Yeah, maybe uh, yeah, sure. I can add uh, a little bit. So, yeah, I guess like everything, uh, I agree with what Rivet, uh shared uh, previously. Like I think it all like comes comes down to like how you can build your own skills because at the end of the day, it's about like passing the bird to prove that you can do the job. And maybe specifically about like finding like the first internship. I feel that it's not only like uh, even back then, I also felt that it was like very hard uh, for me personally to get like first internship and I think like it's probably like natural for like many people to uh, feel like difficult to get to do something for the first time so and one of the common like issues that I noticed as well from some friends back then is that like they were like also kind of kind of picky about like oh yeah I only want to intern at like companies with like with big names or like maybe companies that have like good reputation or whatever but sometimes like i feel i also feel that like it's important at, at the beginning to at least like get something get some experience first it's probably like fine if you work at like probably at some startup that probably like none, none of the people know as long as you get the experience to learn maybe you can have like much better chance when uh, finding like your second internship or stuff or maybe if you even if like you don't get like any internship experience like don't be sad about it and you can also like use the time the summer break to do like let's say projects open source projects or like i think there are like some popular like google summer of code or like whatever like to not sort of like waste the time just because like you can't get an internship because like yeah at the end of the day it's a marathon so like yeah if hmm. uh, you don't get at the your first year maybe like you can prepare start preparing for your second year and stuff yeah hmm. So the idea is to not lose hope. Even if you don't get it now, you'll get it later. Prepare for it, do your best, and try and prepare yourself as well as possible for the next internship cycle and to look for more internships and work on your skills and your projects and things like that. So yeah, that's quite a good point. Okay. Um, the next question, I think, Jolie, you'll be best equipped to answer this particular question. So how does one get a chance at quant internships? Now, they've mentioned GPA less than 4.5, but you may have something different to say about this. So I'll leave you to it. Mm, I think it's very possible to get a quant uh, internship, even if your GPA is less than 4.5. Personally, I know quite a handful of friends who've managed and in this current climate as well. Uh, and this applies for all the quant internships. So whether it's like the more trading or research side or also the dev, like engineering side. Uh, I would say to you, something that you can do to stand out is like be genuinely interested in the finance side of things. So I could be biased because I'm, I, I didn't study computer science and I'm not from an engineering background. 
but uh, nowadays all the quant finance companies, all the hedge funds and trading firms, they all are looking for like the usual STEM graduates. So like CS, math, engineering, all of that, right? And for good reason, but uh, what they're looking for on top of like the technical acumen that these students tend to have, they're also looking for an interest in uh, what they actually do. So that's like being interested in financial markets, right? Maybe doing things like reading news and being up to date on what is going on in the world or what these firms actually do uh, like as a business day to day. Yeah, so showing interest in these things and also working on projects related to finance. So it could be something, could be something simple like, oh, stock price prediction with, don't know, whatever machine learning models, things like that. Like you have to demonstrate that like you don't just have the technical capability, but also like a genuine interest in the business line. Hmm. Yeah, so it's quite interesting actually. And uh, Joey, while I have you, there's another question about quantum finance. Oh, so how can we get to know if quant finance roles are a good fit for us? And because it is, uh, it is difficult to get an idea of what they do in these roles. So what's your advice for students here? Mm. That's actually a pretty good question because it's not the most like transparent industry out there. A lot of things are proprietary, like maybe the strategies you work on or the things that uh, the backend systems that you have to program. Uh, I think the easiest way is to talk to seniors who have interned at these places or who work full time at these places. Right, like at the very least, they touch some part of the business, so they are able to give you an idea of like what the day to day is like, what the work life balance is like, responsibilities, uh, culture as well. Yeah, that's the most. I think that's the most informal and easiest way to get access to like information that is not so widespread. I mean, you do have the bias of it being like a personal thing, like some people might hate. Uh, working in a quant company and so in that case they won't give you like a they won't give you a very objective answer but yeah. uh yeah then you just talk to more people get more perspectives yeah so i think this ties in a little bit with uh, an earlier question about how to get an idea of the company's culture right so if you want to get know about the role that you're applying to and you want to get more details about what you'll be actually doing in that role it's a good idea to go on say linkedin uh, look for people who worked in that role before, worked at that company before, and reach out to them and try and figure out that way, right? So yeah, it's quite a quite a good point. Needs advice actually. Um, thanks. Hmm. There's another question on here. Seem to have lost it. Yeah, here. So what sort of projects would be most useful uh, if you're looking for a big tech internship? So I think this is a ra rather generic question, but might just be interesting to get a viewpoint from, from someone in big tech, maybe Johanna. Mm -hmm. um, I, at the top of my head, like I don't think there are specific Kind of projects but for me personally i um i actually didn't have any like personal projects per se but when i joined hackathons like um we built like some projects right whether it's like games or like useless useless app like that kind of projects um you can in your resume and maybe when they ask like you can share about it because um the thing that they are more interested in is like i think how you build it um, instead of like the specific app itself. So I guess to increase your chance, you might want to build something that is more impactful, I would say more useful, um, yeah, so that it will stand out more compared to like maybe just build an annoying app um, that is actually not very useful. Um, yeah, and I think for big techs, usually maybe these companies have like summer programs um, that you can join. And then when you build um, a project um, during that um, program, yeah, I think it might be able 
um, to increase your chance as well. So for example, actually last time, yeah, I also joined like something similar to like the Google summer program. And then during that um, summer program, like we built um, a project. So um, I think it's not really like what I built per se, but yeah, as long as I guess it's related to your role, I think it would definitely be helpful. And as long as it's not totally useless. Yeah. Okay, that's her advice, really. Um, your products shouldn't, you don't need to have specific idea, like a mm. specific template product in mind, like, oh, I need to do exactly what this other person has done and copy it. You essentially need to have a product that first of all shows the skill that you have skills related to your yeah. the role that you're applying for. Am I correct? Yeah. So, yeah, that, that makes sense. It's pretty good advice. Uh, Jahana, while I have you, can you give a brief answer to this one question? It's got a lot of um, votes on this one. So how useful was NOC for you when securing future internships and jobs? Um, okay, for me personally, I don't think it's super useful um, in a sense that, but for me, it helped in becoming a stepping stone to my next internship, I would say, because um, it is like what um, Stephen mentioned, like it is still an experience. So um, I think for me, it is useful in becoming a stepping stone, but it's not essential. But maybe for uh, you all who are interested more in like um, startups culture, um, then maybe NOC is uh, more prominent because um, yeah, you're basically doing internships like in startups. Yeah, but it doesn't mean that if you don't do NOC, like um, you are unable to secure future internship, internships and jobs. Yeah. Hmm. That's, okay, that's, uh... Quite useful. I hope that satisfies everyone who's been asking this question. <laughs> um, okay, this is actually a pretty interesting question. I feel it is not something that's been covered too much in detail. I think Ben hinted on this in the earlier presentation about asking for help from supervisors. So when you're stuck, how do you balance between you know figuring out the problem by ourselves? Uh, versus asking help from the supervisor or from your manager who's helping you in your internship. Because I feel the uh, idea behind this is that sometimes if you're trying too much to do it on your own, you may stress yourself out, you may end up with the wrong solution. Or on the other hand, if you ask the supervisor too many questions, they may feel that, uh, are we sure we hired the right guy? Is, is he not putting in the effort, something like that, there may be doubts. So how do you strike a balance between these two things? Would anyone like to suggest something? Uh, maybe Stephen or Jotham? Uh, I think when... So basically, like, the most important point is, like, having a document of, like, what you have tried, right? You should document why you're stuck, what the problem is, like, what you have researched and tried, like, what you tried, what, why it didn't work. Like, if you can compile a list that's, like, comprehensive enough and you feel like you've genuinely reached a dead end, then I think that's the time to ask. Yeah, because I, I do agree that if you ask a lot of like minaya questions, like, oh, how, what's a for loop? I think it's a super red flag, but <laughs> it's like basically showing that you have put in the effort to do the work and then like ask the question. Yeah. Yeah, that, I, I think that's fair. Documenting what you've tried, what, what you've tried and what has failed so far for you is a good idea. It shows that it shows your supervisor that, look, I've actually tried this and it's not working and I can't think anymore. Can you really help me out? Instead of just going up to them blankly and saying, yeah, I tried for like five minutes and don't know what's going on. So that's that's quite a fair, uh, quite, quite a fair expectation to actually document your attempts at solving the problem. Does anyone else have any, um, any tips to add on here? Um, okay, I guess I can add more color. So I totally agree with what Jodham um, mentioned. So on top of that, what I think we can do is to um, set a limit on how long we can get stuck. So, um, but I, I guess it's arbitrary for um, different people. Um, so the guideline for me, maybe like if I get stuck for like one hour, that means, um, yeah, I should just ask. But again, applying with what Jodham um, shared, like we should do our due diligence first 
And the way we phrase our question is um, very important as well. So we don't just ask how to do this, but um, this is what I want to do. This is what I've tried. Then this is where I'm stuck at. So I guess um, by giving that, um, yeah, um, the person who's answering your question like have more context and won't feel so sien like answering your question. And mm -hmm. I guess also um, you should take a look at like how urgent your project is um, because uh, yeah, if let's say you are hindering like the, um, the, the project of like a big project, for example, and then because you are stuck and you are just so paise to ask questions, you are basically stalling the whole um, project. So mm -hmm. I guess in that sense, like it's better to just ask, yeah, maybe set a time limit and then ask questions directly. Yeah. Yeah, that's quite fair. I think it's it's a good idea to see where, how important your task is. If it's like uh, the deadline's tomorrow, it's, it's a good idea to ask for help instead of waiting till the last minute and hoping you suddenly get an idea, right? So that, that's, that's a completely fair point, actually. Um, yeah, uh, there's a question on here that I think, again, it builds on one of the questions we've done earlier. So how do you assess different companies when making your decision? while you're applying or maybe you're accepting an offer, you have multiple offers and you want to decide which one to take. So how do you uh, how do you come to that decision? Um, maybe Steven or Raiva, do you guys want to try this question? Sure. Yeah, maybe I think it's also, it also depends on the context, whether like it's for internship or for like full-time job. I mean, for me, when uh, making decision for internship, it was more of a, because like I considered my internships in the past as sort of more of an exploration process. So when I got like offers, I was, uh, the, my thinking process revolved more around like, whether like what kind of experience I had not had and what kind of experience I would like to get for my next internship. And that's where like I uh sort of like made the decision of oh I want to try this comp uh working at this company or I want to try working on this like area or like domain or like with a particular team. Meanwhile <clears throat> for because like internship like I said previously it was a more like it's a shorter time period, like usually only like three months. Some people do it for like six months, but it's pretty rare to have like a long uh, duration like in the ship meanwhile for full time it's like a rather like different decision because like for full time uh most people stay for at least like one year uh and for me uh at the moment i have been in in the company i'm working for for like two and a half years so yeah and so it's like a longer like time horizon so for me like when making like a decision for like full-time job, I made it based on my internship experience in the past be, uh, because like I had like the privilege to try like a bunch of like different uh, types of like companies at like different domains. So uh, by the time like I I make my, I made the decision on what to do for full-time job, I had like more information and hence like, I guess like it, I could make a decision that's better suit my preferences. Okay. Yeah, I think that's that's a fair, and I think Steve, you've done like quite well to explain the points that uh, explain the sort of considerations that go into accepting uh, offers or applying to companies for internships. So diversity is one thing you may want to try and explore a little bit. See if uh, this is a role that you've already done before. If you're applying for a new internship, or if it's your first internship, you may just want to try and apply to various roles and see that. Uh, which one you want to try out first, which one you think you might like more and so on. Getting an idea of the company culture as well is another thing as well uh, uh, that Stephen just mentioned and we've also talked about earlier. Um, I'll move on to, I'll go back to some of the pre-prepared questions now. And uh, I think this one is, yes? Can I just, uh, add on? Yes, sure, sure. Uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, I thought I'll just add in while we are at this point. No Steven covered all the points really well. I definitely agree with him. What I wanted to add on um, is 
that oftentimes I think one thing to realize is that let's say if you have multiple offers, that's great. That I mean that shows that you have options. I think one possibility is that you don't necessarily have to reject an offer. So for example, let's say you have two offers, company A, company B, both are giving you an offer for the summer. Um, you can, let's say if you made your choice that you like company A more than company B, you can always go back to company B uh, and be like, hey, I already like have another offer that I want to do for the summer for whatever reason. Can I instead intern from like, let's say after the summer to the end of uh, monsoon or whatever. So you can also adjust those things that way uh, instead of rejecting offers. Or you can tell them that, hey, can I come back at another time uh, in the next uh, semester or whatever? So you don't necessarily have to reject an offer uh, to um, basically go with another offer. And another thing I think which is very important in mind is I think once you have an offer, I think that is a signal that you have a decent enough connection with the company uh, or with the recruiting team. Uh, itself and you shouldn't lose that i think especially in this market right so you can even if you reject the offer you can always tell them that i'd love to stay in touch uh, and you can always like let's say when you're shopping for uh, a full-time offer you can always go back to them uh, and what that can uh, do is let's say if, if i had rejected company b but i'm again in the market for a full-time offer you can always go back to the recruiter and be like oh can i interview for the full-time role again and because you have already cleared some uh, rounds in the internship interviews before you can always ask to let's say hey can i just skip one of the rounds or a few of the rounds and in most cases i have seen it actually works oh uh, that's quite interesting i didn't know that at all um yeah okay well I, I actually didn't know that i'm not sure what to say i'm speechless <laughs> um thanks for your input really uh both steven and Raivat. uh i think we can wrap this up with the last question and again this is open to anyone who wants to answer this so how do you prepare for the non-technical aspects of an interview um many people know to prepare for coding questions or we do leak code or this or that but I don't think too many people think about this. So I think it's quite interesting to get your viewpoint on this. Anyone wants to uh, take this question? Maybe Jolie? Hey, hey, sure, I can take this question. So by non-technical, I'm assuming it means like HR or behavioral. Interviews, yeah, behavioral right? interview with the HR yeah. manager and so on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say... First off, know your resume really well, such that like if the HR person points at any line on the resume and asks you, tell me about this, you should be able to answer it. Like, you can use the, the star method or whatever it is that they teach you in interview prep. Um, second is know your motivations for wanting to intern at the company. I think... Uh, when we are applying for lots of internships, we get really caught up in like uh, just spraying and praying, applying to as many as possible, yeah. right? Mm. And that that is the nature of the game. But you should also have a rough idea of like what this company does, what the job description is, and uh, how your skill set fits the the role that they are hiring for. So that when these questions ask uh, come out in the HR interview, like you have a solid answer. It's not just oh, um, I want to work here because, like, mm. yeah, I like I don't know, I like software engineering or something like that. It's very generic. Yep. Yeah, that, that's a fair point. You need to know the company that you're applying to. Uh, I think the most obvious mistake is the, the most obvious mistake not to make would be to give the wrong name of the company during your interview. Um, so that's one thing. Another thing, yes, you did mention you need to research the company well, that you need to know what role you're applying to. You need to know what the work would entail and you need to be able to tie that in with your interest to show that you really are interested in that role and you really can do something for the company in that role. Does anyone else want to add on to this before we wrap up? Um, and assuming not, I think, I think that's a good place to end, um, end this panel discussion. So th thank you everyone for, thank you all to all the panelists for actually coming and taking our time out of your busy schedules to actually help out and answer some questions from our audience and both from 
uh, people who are applying to internships, I'm sure that your answers would be very useful to them. It would give them a lot of courage, maybe even to uh, apply to internships and try their best out. Uh, I'd also like to thank Jia Hao and Ben for their presentation earlier uh, today. And I think it really had a lot of important information about the application cycle, as well as uh, some tips on improving your application, improving your chances of success during the application process. Um, to sign off now, I'd just like to mention a few things. So first of all, a few of you have been asking for the slides. We will be sending out these slides later on. Uh, there's also a link at the bottom of uh, this slide that you see here, uh, hacker.cc slash project intern 24 slides, if you want to go there, and we will be sending out the link as well. Some useful Telegram groups are these two here. We've got the NES Hackers uh, channel, the announcement channel, where we post all of our events, such as this uh, talk and our upcoming hackathon, Hack and Roll, that'll be in January. We also have the project intern chat that is specific to people who are looking for internships. We've got quite a few admins uh, from NES Hackers who have a lot of internship experience, as well as other uh, mentors who are willing to give their time to for instance, review your resume or give you some advice on accepting offers and so on. And lastly, I'd like to mention the mentorship program that we've set up. So every year we connect mentees with mentors and allow you, you to have a one-to-one -one session. So this year, the signups for mentees will be opening in about one hour's time. And the sign-up link will be broadcast on both of these groups. So take a few minutes to scan this QR code and join these groups and be on the lookout for this. Um, so essentially the mentorship program, you will be, uh, you'll be connected with a mentor as a mentee and you will have the chance to talk to them one-on-one -on -one with about internships, about the internship process, the application cycle, and really anything you may want to ask. So once again, thank you everyone for coming and thank you to our panelists and to our speakers. Uh, wish you a good evening and goodbye.